I first uh, met a Mexican-American boy by the name of Louis, 19 year old. He was ba showing uh, fighting in Korea and slipped and fell with a Browning automatic rifle and it shot out his left eye and his whole left cerebral hemisphere. For six months he was in an army hospital in Japan, never said a word, was sent to an aphasia center in Long Beach, California, where I was just newly hired. He was my first patient, actually. I went to see him, and he could say nothing. The second day I saw him, and he was able to hum. And when you hum and open your mouth, out comes a word like ma, ma. He would say ma, ma. He was so excited saying that, that uh, the patients on the ward said he never stopped practicing. So we gave him some other M words. I had written them down on a loose leaf notebook. I worked with Louis for nine months and we started using words that began with M, which he could produce, ma, me, more, my, and so forth. After nine months, I went to graduate school actually. Never saw him again until 15 years later. He was on a panel in Los Angeles of recovered aphasics. And uh, he talked about his early therapy. And we met at the break. I came forward, he came down from the platform, and he embraced me with his one good arm and said, I just want to thank you for helping me learn to talk again. I first ran into Parkinson's disease when I was nine years old. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had haircuts with a barber who had non-intention tremor. And in his right hand, he would be shaking. And I would come into the barber shop. He said, hi, Danny. Now get up on the chair and let me cut your hair. So I got up on the chair and thought he was probably going to cut my ear. He had Parkinson's. At Highland View Hospital in Cleveland, probably 1956, I worked with a Parkinson lady by the name of Rose. Our therapy was using intention, where we tried to prolong the vowels as she spoke. We tried to get her to speak louder and to enunciate the articulations at the end of each word, anything to make her talk, thinking about trying to talk louder, clearer, and so forth. She and I uh, had an appointment like 11.30 in the morning. Around noon, we were done. My job was to walk with Rose back to her ward, which was one flight lower in stairs. So we took the elevator. We walked down the hallway with our shuffle, and finally we get to the elevator. We press the button. We can see the car coming up by number, the door is suddenly open, and she can't move because she has gait apraxia, G-A-I-T, gait apraxia. She can't move on purpose. And the door would open, and I tried to get her to walk into the elevator. I just can't do it, I can't do it, I can't, I can't do it. So I finally discovered that if we got back some distance from the elevator door, when it came up again, we would be able to, if I held her arm and we walked fast, we could walk right into the elevator if I counted. So I counted one to 15. Here comes the elevator, the door open. One, two, three, four, five. We rush in and get in the elevator. But the elevator car wasn't deep enough to use that same strategy to get out. Then I discovered that it was somewhat rectangular. And if we started in one corner of the elevator, we could count our way out. But uh, we had some practice doing this, so much so that other people I knew who worked in the hospital wondered, what in the world is Dan doing, going up and down in the elevator? And I told them, we were just taking a tour of the hospital. That was Rose. The uh, extra pyramidal track is basically essential for any kind of automatic movement. Uh, as you see in the diagram, there are many connections
to the basal ganglia nuclei, like the lenticular nucleus, the thalamus, and so forth. Many, many connections, hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands of connections, sub-nuclei below the nucleus of these areas. I call them almost the country road, but they are essential for automatic function. Parkinson's disease is a disease where that part of the brain does not get the dopamine it needs to function. Dopamine is essential for lubricating almost each synapse within the basal ganglia. And without the dopamine, the axonal pathways, let's say, between the nuclei are faulty and do not function well. As opposed to the pyramidal tract, which I call a neural turnpike, it's a bundle of fibers that goes right through the basal ganglia, which is not dopamine dependent. Both pyramidal and extrapyramidal fibers end at the same nuclei in the medulla and the brain stem and spinal cord. So the impulses innervate the nuclei which goes out to the muscles. So the same muscles receive impulses either from pyramidal tract or extrapyramidal. The extrapyramidal tract impulses are impaired because of the lack of dopamine up above. The pyramidal come in strong and clear, and that's why we use intention. It involves the use of the pyramidal tract, and with intention, you somewhat bypass the uh, sub lower brain areas. I'd like to talk a little about intention and non-intention as it relates to sports. Uh, for example, basketball. When a player is dribbling down the court, he is using the extrapyramidal system. This is essential for all kinds of sports where you don't have to think what you're doing, it just happens automatically. And uh, in basketball, the dribble would be an extrapyramidal function. The free shot, where you really have to think what you're doing, is really an extra, uh, is a pyramidal shot. And uh, so some people are good at free throws and not so good dribbling, others are the other way around. Also in baseball, pyramidal function is required in the outfield where you run and set yourself for a fly ball. An extra pyramidal is the sudden movements you have to make in the infield. Like a shortstop can't think what he's doing, it's all automatic. That's an extra pyramidal function. In tennis, which I like to play, uh, serving is a pyramidal. And uh, actually the court play, you can't think about what you're doing, is more extra pyramidal. At Highland View Hospital way back in the 50s, I discovered intention as a system that we could use in therapy that would help people speak better. Normal speaking is highly automatic. It's an extra pyramidal function. Motor abilities, the palate lifts, the vocal folds come together. Whatever you're doing, you have no awareness of what you're doing. When you become aware of it, this is using intention, and that's a pyramidal track function. And one example of pyramidal function would be talking louder. Another would be prolonging what you say. That's an artificial way of talking. You have to think to do it. Another would be try to make your speech more like this. And when I started with intention, if I found a patient who could speak with an accent, on purpose, uh, they would usually speak clearer than if they didn't use the accent. So intention employs probably the loudness feature being the one we use the most. About three years ago, Samantha Ellendary called me on the phone and she read something that she had never thought of before in helping people speak louder. She read what I wrote about intention. 
not just using loudness, but using prolongation, and the other things we've talked about. And uh, she invited me and my wife to come out to Dallas area and uh, see their fall program. We came, we went to an auditorium, and on the program were about 110 Parkinson patients with song books. And as the curtain opened, they hit a song. Loud, I couldn't believe it. And uh, I can still feel the chill in my spine from hearing that. We then, the next day, observed people in therapy. And in short, the people that were in the Parkinson Project were patients with Parkinson's disease, speaking louder and clearer than any patient like this I'd ever heard before. I was so impressed by it that uh, I told her I'd like to come back. So I've been a consultant to the program ever since. In voice therapy, one of our techniques of helping people with various disorders is to work on breathing, increase your volume, and increase the amount of air you can say on one breath to lengthen your exhalation. And we may say to people, you can count to 14 and then you kind of run out of air. I'd recommend that when you talk in the real world, you limit your what you say to seven or eight words. For example, as I've been speaking to you, I renew my breath about every seven words. I do that just by pausing. And when you pause, you automatically renew the breath. You don't have to lift your shoulders. You don't have to push down with the diaphragm. You just pause and the breath renews itself. Well, in Parkinson's training, we kind of avoid the typical therapy program of increasing your volume and projecting longer durations. We have found that if you just speak with intention, using the principles of loudness or prolongation or accent, that you can avoid having to work on the component of respiration. When you use intention as you speak, you are louder, you speak slower, and your articulation is clearer. In working with any patient with any disorder, like loss of voice, like a paralysis of a vocal cord, we, in our initial therapy, it's an evaluation to find out what the patient can still do. We always start with something they can still do and we make a recommendation, let's try to make that a little bigger or make it a little longer. So searching for what the patient can do is a feature of what I would call the Boone approach to voice therapy. And I started writing about it in 1971, was the edition, first edition of the book, The Voice and Voice Therapy. It's now in the ninth edition which is a long history for any textbook, and it's in eight languages, Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, uh, Arab recently, and English. Our field has become very mechanical in focus, as we have uh, many gadgets, electronic, today to work with. We have handheld, uh, iPads and iPods and what have you. Humanism is kind of lost. So I still like to have my patients spend some time touching somebody's arm and saying, how are you doing today? I prefer taking the time to establish a human being relationship. Then I search for what they can do. And what I introduce as a therapy technique is based on what they can do, plus my knowledge of other ways to do that same thing. 